Good morning and welcome to chapter 26. So in this chapter, we're gonna be looking at the civil rights movement. And you'll notice the dates here when I um, get the PowerPoint pulled up, you will notice these dates, 1941 to 1973. So this was the, you know, basically this, what we call the long struggle for the civil rights movement. I think we most often associate it with the 1960s where there are some more um, events that draw more media attention, but we need to look at the full civil rights movement, the full scope of this, and then also other groups that begin to emulate what the African-American community did to, to draw attention and get policy changed regarding civil rights. All right, so if we are looking at this, um, we are going to consider how the New Deal, which was about more government involvement in uh, the economy, more government involvement in regulations of businesses and, and that kind of thing, how that New Deal liberalism, we talked about that movement from classical to modern liberalism, we're now going to see that that is going to include what we know, what we call rights liberalism, where you're looking at the identities of various groups of people and whether or not they are treated equally under the law in the United States. And so that's kind of where, where we begin. We've talked before about the Great Migration and we can definitely see from this, this is an old map and it's looking at populations at this time. Okay, so this is looking at 1950 and you can see county populations and with this color code here, you're looking at a larger uh, number of African-Americans living in these places in purple, pink, blue, and green. So we can definitely begin to see that urban areas become more heavily populated with African-Americans. So there are two types of segregation. There is de jour segregation, which is legally mandated. So this would be Plessy versus Ferguson with the court ruling. We've got Jim Crow laws at the state level in the South. Those are all mandating segregation in all public facilities, in all schools. Um, restaurants, water fountains, as you see, buses, public buses, you can definitely see the, the segregation. So the de jour mag, uh, segregation is mandated. De facto segregation is a little bit different. This is where there are underlying um, ways of doing things that will also further segregate communities. A lot of that has to do with real estate. Um, contracts would not be given to black home buyers in white neighborhoods, or you might have zoning for a school district, right? Which neighborhoods go to which school? That would also factor in um, to many of these decisions. So we call that de facto segregation. And look at this quote from Shirley Chisholm. She was one of the early um, African-American female politicians. And look what she says, the difference between de jour and de facto segregation is the difference between open forthright bigotry, which is de jour, and the shame-faced kind that works through unwritten agreements between real estate dealers, school officials, and local politicians. That would be de facto segregation. So you've got both of those going on and is uh, heavily entrenched across the United States. So if we think about de jour segregation, that's gonna be seen more in the South. De facto segregation is going to also be seen in the Northern cities as well, where you see those urban populations. All right, the uh, organizations that we've talked about before that were working towards trying to demand African-American rights, we started early on with W.E.B. Du Bois and the Niagara Movement trying to create the um, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People or the NAACP in 1909. So that would have been during the progressive era. Then we talked about Marcus Garvey with his Back to Africa movement in the 1920s, where he was talking about that integration of the races would never fully be achieved. And uh, he was um, eventually deported as we talked about. But things begin to change after World War II. We see the success of the Tuskegee Airmen. We see African-American soldiers fighting very, very um, successfully in World War II. 
And we also will have some new leaders begin to emerge in the 1940s and 1950s. So you'll remember that during World War II, A. Philip Randolph had really pressed Franklin Roosevelt for civil rights changes with his March on Washington that was, that was planned, but never actually carried out. And you may remember we talked about the double V campaign, victory at home and victory abroad. And ultimately what that did was uh, Franklin Roosevelt to maintain the, the flow of New Deal programs and then also the efforts <clears throat> um, for production for the, the war materials in the early 1940s, the executive order 8802 was passed. That meant that there was fair hiring practices mandated for all businesses receiving federal money. And, and that, that is a step in the right direction. But we're not finished with A. Philip Randolph. He's still going to play a pretty prominent role here when we get to the 1960s. But he's really kind of this, this foundation that begins and launches this long civil rights movement. So here's the double V campaign, victory at home and victory abroad. Um, and then look what we've got here, backing the attack on all fronts, win the war and plan for peace, that this was a, a way to draw attention to the cause. So there are a lot of civil rights organizations that will be very important. This one is probably one of the earliest. We've talked about the NAACP. Their focus is going to be more about promoting legal change. They're gonna work through the court system. They're gonna provide legal defense to African-Americans. The Congress on Racial Equality is a little different. This is going to be more of an organization that's going to draw the community together and protest as a community, not necessarily through the court system. So the Congress on Racial Equality or CORE as it's most often called is going to pattern a lot of its activities on um, Gandhi and the, the work in India to achieve independence from Great Britain. So the nonviolent social protest is going to be there. We've mentioned before the idea of civil disobedience from Thoreau back during the transcendentalist times in the late 1800s. So this is all kind of um, the approach that CORE will take and other organizations will eventually emulate what CORE has started. This is the, the man who is the founder of CORE. His name is James Farmer. If you've ever seen, there's a great movie um, that, that came out and it was called uh, um, The Great Debaters. And it's based on a true story. And it's about this debate team from a small black college. Um, I wanna say it was maybe in, I don't remember what state it was in, but anyway, um, the, there's a, a child in the debate team. He's kind of like this genius and his father's a minister in this town and there's a, it's a college town. And um, the young boy, he's probably 12, 13 years old and he enrolls in the college. Well, that boy is James Farmer and he's on this debate team. It's um, obviously it's an African-American college and the debate team is going to be restricted in which other colleges they can participate in, which tournaments they can participate in. And there's a lot of um, very, very violent actions that are going to be lodged against this group of debaters as they move through the country. And it's, it's trying to, it molds these young people, but it's also telling this story of perseverance. And James Farmer, experienced all of that as a young boy. Then as he becomes an adult, he starts this organization, the Congress on Racial Equality, that's working towards trying to combat all of those terrible experiences that he had when he was um, in, on the debate team in, in the college. There were some um, limited successes early on. You've got Major League Baseball that will integrate with Jackie Robinson being the first uh, African-American. He will be playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. There was a movie that came out about Jackie Robinson not too many years ago, but look what he's saying. I'm not concerned with you liking or disliking me. All I ask is that you respect me as a human being. And so this was a, a very, very difficult situation for him personally as the um, um, segregation resistance is going to, to follow him as his team travels around. All right, so the New Deal coalition is going to begin to fall apart because as Truman comes in, 
he's going to be very reluctant to, um, at first, to, to get involved in the civil rights issues, but he begins to take more bold steps. So he's going to desegregate the military. He does that also with an executive order because it would not have made its way through the Congress. After he desegregates the armed forces, that's leading up to that election year in 1948, where we talked about all of these different groups that had traditionally been strong um, supporters for uh, votes for the Democratic Party begins to fracture. And we talked about how white Southern Democrats begin to resist. And it starts here with the desegregation of the armed forces. The Dixiecrats are formed. We mentioned those also in chapter 24. Um, here's Strom Thurmond running in 1948 on this idea of states' rights. States' rights to do what? Maintain Jim Crow laws, which is going to be their, their main premise. Okay. NAACP that we mentioned before is going to be working through the court system, trying to overturn unfair laws that have been passed by the legislative branch in order to protect African-American rights. And Thurgood Marshall is going to be one of the attorneys that will be part of the NAACP. And that's where he really launches his career uh, is with the NAACP. And he ends up becoming the lawyer from a for a very famous case, Brown versus Board of Education. So the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, will provide legal defense for the Brown family in their um, case against the school board in Kansas. Thurgood Marshall is their attorney. And when he ultimately wins the, um, the case before the Supreme Court, he becomes quite famous. And later on, he will be appointed as the first African-American judge on the Supreme Court. So here is Thurgood Marshall later in his career as a Supreme Court judge, again, the first African-American Supreme Court judge, but he got his start with the NAACP as an attorney in the case Brown versus Board of Education. We're gonna be looking at this case a little bit more closely in class and doing, doing one of those uh, um, casing history um, activities but it's going to challenge the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling of separate but equal being okay. And the situation, this little girl, Linda Brown, lived close to the elementary school, the white elementary school in her town of Topeka, Kansas. But she was forced to go a great distance from her home to attend the black school in Topeka. And so she sued that her, um, her equal protection under the law was being violated. So again, that's that 14th Amendment challenge that we're talking about. So before the Supreme Court, Chief, I mean, uh, Thurgood Marshall will argue the case. And there is a new Chief Justice on the Supreme Court, and his name is Earl Warren. And I would definitely emphasize his name, Earl Warren, because he basically tips the, uh, the voting in the Supreme Court to be more liberal. Now, we had seen prior to Franklin Roosevelt coming in with the New Deal programs, that it was a very conservative court. And the New Deal liberalism was often struck down as unconstitutional by that court. Well, here we are now in the 1950s. So we're another decade and a half, almost two decades removed from when Roosevelt was trying to first put forward the um, the civil rights legislation, I mean, the uh, New Deal legislation in the 1930s. So now we've kind of tipped the, the balance of the court to be more of a liberal leaning court. And Earl Warren represents that. He had um, previously been the governor of California and he is going to write the unanimous decision. And I think that's also important. This was not a split decision. This was a unanimous decision on the Supreme Court that separate but equal is not acceptable, that it does not meet the standard of the government. So here's the thing. They say that segregation is not allowed, but they don't have any sort of timeline for when segregation in schools has to end. So it's pretty clear that Southern states with this idea, think about what the Dixiecrats are promoting, states' rights, they're going to be challenging this ruling by the Supreme Court. So this is a pivotal case. And I want you to notice the dates on here. This is um, 1954 is when this is passed. 
So I think oftentimes students assume that the Brown case and overturning segregation happened in the 60s. It didn't, it happened in the 1950s. But implementation of this new ruling is where there's going to be a sticking point. A year after the Brown case was decided in 1954, a second case called Brown II is going to be implemented. All right, so look at what Earl Warren has to say about the, king, about the case. This is a quote from the ruling. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. If you're separating um, children, then you've already established that there's not equality between those children. So you can imagine the backlash. Here's a, an example of that from the South. Um, so Brown II is issued the following year. So this is a follow-up to the original Brown versus Board of Education ruling in 1954. In 1955, the Brown II decision creates a timeline for when integration has to happen. And it says that it has to happen with all deliberate speed, basically meaning as quickly as possible. Well, what does that mean? So here's the issue. There's no specific deadline. They don't say that by the beginning of the school year, 1957, all public schools in America have to be integrated. They say that all public schools in America have to be integrated with all deliberate speed. So of course, you're going to see schools that are going to say, we're going as fast as we can, but really there's absolutely no effort to make any sort of, of change. You can see these protests that are playing out in um, school districts across the United States. All right, another part of the reaction here will be organization among white uh, supremacists to try to prevent integration from happening in their communities. One way is through what were known as white citizens councils. Notice what they are talking about, states rights, racial integrity. Um, so these white citizens councils are going to be more about kind of local policy decision-making, but also the Ku Klux Klan. Here's the third spike in membership in the Ku Klux Klan. We talked about the first one when it was first created during reconstruction in the 1860s. The second one we talked about spiked in the 1920s, which was a little bit different because it had a lot of a backlash against immigration. Here's the, the third spike in KKK membership, and that's going to be after the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. So this is directly in response to the uh, mandated integration that comes from this court ruling. All right, white senators and representatives are going to formally lodge their protest in a document known as the Southern Manifesto that says that they as states have power to determine what happens in their schools. And they're relying on the 10th Amendment as their argument. So if you'll remember, the, um, the Constitution talks about powers that are de designated to the federal government, powers um, that are uh, reserved for the state government, but then everything else is left to the states. And that's what is talked about in the 10th Amendment that, um, you know, it ensures that that rights and, and powers that are not designated in the Constitution are preserved for the states. So that's what they're they're arguing is giving them this power for states' rights. Notice the two main um, authors of the Southern Manifesto, over 100 senators and representatives from the Deep South sign it. Strom Thurmond, he was the candidate for president from uh, the Dixiecrat Party, but then also Richard Russell from Georgia. He was a very, very powerful senator from the state of Georgia in the 1940s and 1950s. And he is one of the main forces behind this protest against integration of schools. One place where we see this fight over integration play out very vividly is with the Little Rock Nine. And the Little Rock Nine are nine African-American students in Little Rock, Arkansas, that are going to be the first to integrate their high school, Central High School in Little Rock. Um, these students were not forced to do this. They volunteered. They knew it was going to be difficult. Um, and they were ready to go to school. Well, the first day of school rolls around and the entire community is right there uh, at Little Rock High School uh, shouting and 
uh, trying to force these students not to, to enter school. Uh, you can see the, um, the protest here. So these high school students are, are going after this um, young girl. Her name was Elizabeth Eckford. And she uh, has been interviewed a number of times. I'll show you a clip when we get to, uh, to class about this. But think about what courage that took for these nine kids to come to school. Well, on that first day, they were blocked from entering. It was uh, the governor was there. They were blocking the entrance to the school. And it was just a, a very, very chaotic scene that played out on television. Eisenhower was president at this time. And he was reluctant uh, to get involved, but he ends up sending out the, um, the Army National Guard to come and protect the safety of these students and to follow the mandate of the Supreme Court. Because again, what happens if the federal government allows a state to not follow a federal ruling in a court case? Then what happens to that balance of power, federal versus state power? So Eisenhower sends in the, um, the soldiers, right? Governor Orwell Favis of, of Arkansas is highly upset, but these kids are going to be escorted to school. These nine students, they're gonna be escorted by the National Guard. They gain entrance to the school and the school year begins. The entire school year, the Army National Guard will patrol Central High School. They will be in the hallways, they will, um, there will be guards assigned to each student to protect their safety. But even with all of that, when you look, when you watch interviews with these students, the students who are still alive from the Little Rock Nine, and they talk about what they had to endure, it was just horrendous, the bullying that they experienced and the danger that they were involved in. But they all talked about the importance of what they were doing. All right, here is Central High School today. It is a gorgeous high school. Um, and it's actually um, one of the more diverse schools in Arkansas today, which I think is kind of interesting. It's got this long history, you know, going back to this fight over integration. But today it's, it's got, I forget how many different languages of, um, are spoken among students in this, in this high school. And it is, definitely a very, very diverse school today. I was fortunate to be able to go there a few years ago, and it was kind of odd. The high school, which is still in operation, it is a normal public high school, is also um, a national park. So there are, there's a national park service museum across the street from the high school with the park rangers you know, if you were a little kid and you did the, the junior rangers program, when you go to national parks, how they have the, the park rangers that tell the story of what's going on in these places and you get the little badges, all of that's in the museum across the street. So when we went there, I just assumed it was the museum, but the tour goes into the high school. Now, can you imagine here uh, at school if every day there were just random people touring your building? So when they took us in, um, and I thought that was also kind of interesting in this age of heightened security within high schools. But in any event, we started in the theater and they, the park ranger sat our group down and, and talked to us about the school. And the, the kids in the theater class were working on sets for their upcoming play. And they're all in the theater and we walk in and they, you know, welcome to, wel welcome to Central High School. You pass kids in the hallway, welcome to Central High School. Clearly they've been trained to say that, but it was just bizarre to go on a historical tour in an operating high school during a normal school day. It was, it was quite odd. And it wasn't like our group had any special privilege. This went on a couple of times a day that the park rangers would give tours at Central High School. Here's what it looks like. That's a high school. Um, isn't it just this gorgeous building? And so it dates back to the late 40s and the early 50s. And um, I mean, it was, it was tremendous. And there's been very little renovation inside. So the tile work is the same that it was in the 1950s. But again, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous school. And it's got this reflecting pool in the front and, and all of that. Um, here is the street that Elizabeth Eckford was walking down when you saw that um, image captured 
with those kids just shouting those insults at her. All right, so as we move into this, this new part of the civil rights movement, um, you're going to see more organization to the efforts. We've got the Brown versus Board of Education case that's been decided, but there's still this fight over how long it's taking to integrate schools and what about other public facilities. All right, one other violent act that really solidifies a lot of support for trying to, to fight against the, the racism and segregation is the lynching of Emmett Till. He was a, a young um, kid who had come to visit family during the summer of, um, um, I forget which year it was, but anyway, um, in Missis he was in Mississippi during the summer, during this time period in the, in the late 50s. And he was brutally, brutally murdered. And the case, there was one eyewitness who happened to be Emmett Till's uncle. And when the uncle was there, he clearly identified who was responsible because he was an eyewitness. But the all white jury found these white um, defendants innocent, even though there was an eyewitness saying who was guilty. So this causes a lot of uproar about the lack of justice that has been carried out for Emmett Till. So this launches again, more, um, more action among people to organize. 1955, we see in Alabama, the Montgomery bus boycotts. There were segregated buses throughout the city of Montgomery through a local ordinance. And in December of 1955, there are groups of, of churches actually that come together to plan boycotts of the Montgomery bus system. A lot of this has to do with a with backlash from Rosa Parks' uh, refusal to give up her seat on the bus, and she was arrested for that. So as a result of her arrest, these churches are going to launch into action, and the Black churches are going to be very instrumental in organization. If you're going to boycott a public bus system, the point they're trying to make is that they're paying the same um, fee to ride the public transportation system as white patrons, but yet they're not treated equally. So if you remove the uh, funding that black patrons are providing to the Montgomery bus service, the point that they're trying to make is that our money is critical to your operation. So they are going to organize carpooling. They're gonna organize um, efforts to walk to work, make sure that everyone is getting where they need to be and not use that bus system. And it works because eventually the Montgomery um, City Council is going to have to back off and allow for the integration of the bus system. So this was successful. This was an early effort where you see nonviolent social protest eventually bring about a change in segregation policy. As part of these Montgomery bus boycotts, Martin Luther King Jr. was a young minister at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church uh, in Montgomery, and he was instrumental in, in putting all this together with the other churches in Montgomery and, and making sure that there was training about nonviolence and about not reacting. Um, and that was part of it. You know, it's going to be hard to take the insults and um, potentially the violence that's going to come your way in these types of protests in these very racially charged situ situations. So Mar Martin Luther King Jr., and the other church leaders are going to be important in planning out the boycotts and also preparing the participants for the types of reactions that they're going to have to um, endure. So he and the other ministers um, decide that this needs to be a, a more widespread network of black churches across the South, not just in Montgomery. And Martin Luther King Jr. teams up with one of his, um, um, childhood friends from Atlanta. Martin Luther King, we knew, we know, grew up in Atlanta. Ralph David Abernathy, Abernathy did as well. And so these two individuals from Atlanta will start this organization called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC. And they're going to use the churches as an avenue to try to bring about more uh, protest to, to force change, civil rights change, but they're also going to be very, very clear about this being a nonviolent effort. So the SCLC does still exist today. Its headquarters is here in Atlanta. 
And this is the organization that Martin Luther King founded along with Ralph David Abernathy. Students are going to get involved in a lot of this um, effort for protest. And it starts here with the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. There is a um, uh, HBCU in Greensboro, North Carolina. And these four students are going to challenge the segregation at the Woolworths lunch counter. So Woolworths is a department store. Um, it kind of reminds me of a, a Target in many ways. You know how at Target you can buy everything from, um, I don't know, automobile equipment to sporting goods to clothing. Um, you can buy everything at, Wool at uh, Target. You can do the same thing at Woolworths. And at Target, isn't there a snack counter where I think you can get pizza there or a hamburger or something like that? Um, Woolworths had a lunch counter as well, but it was probably the go-to spot in Greensboro, North Carolina. These lunch counters were very, very famous for getting a burger and a milkshake, but they did not serve black customers. So these four students are going to protest. So they walk in, okay? They're going to be dressed very nicely. They walk in, they're not going to be arguing. They're just going to sit down at the lunch counter as a form of protest and they refuse to leave. And so the crowd starts to gather um, as the, the lunch hour approaches, they're being yelled at, um, racial slurs are being yelled at them and they don't leave. And so this is drawing attention to the situation, their nonviolent form of protest. Um, this is a, a pretty famous picture there. You can notice that the man behind the counter can work there washing dishes, but he cannot be served there as a customer. And so that's the, the irony here that is so very important. So this idea of nonviolent sit-ins is going to spread throughout the country. Young people are going to conduct sit-ins uh, in segregated facilities across the United States. Here in Atlanta, the um, students at Morehouse and Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, um, are all going to come together in the Atlanta student movement. And they're going to pinpoint all of these places across the Atlanta that have segregated lunch counters, that have segregated facilities, and they divide it up and they plan out and they're going to have a sit-in protest simultaneously at all of these points at the same time. That will be later on in 1960 and 1961. We'll talk more about that in class as well. So um, the students in the sit-ins, again, are using this approach, this nonviolent form of protest that is uh, important to Martin Luther King. Once these students begin to have these protests across the United States, they formalize their organization into the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, uh, as it's most often referred. So SNCC, S-N-C-C, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, is about college students across America uh, coming together for protesting. Um, SNCC is prim primarily made up of black students from black colleges and universities, but there are also white student movement um, supporters coming from colleges primarily in the North that will support SNCC in their effort. The organizer of SNCC is Ella Baker, and she is a very, very prominent civil rights um, icon and one of the, the female icons within the civil rights movement. And they organize, um, they have their first meeting at Shaw University, another black college, and they've got 30 or 40 different colleges that are all coming together for membership in SNCC. And again, they've got to try to make sure that racial equality is, is brought about but they also train the kids on how not to react. And that is a hard thing to do when you're being harassed at the level that these people are being harassed during their protest to not react to it because they know that this is going to get media attention. Now think about it. If there is media attention on these protests like these students right here, and you've got this white mob that is just you know shouting and throwing things and just being completely, completely over the top in their opposition to this protest and these students aren't reacting and photographs are taken and they're printed in newspapers across the country, who is clearly the aggressor? Who is clearly in the wrong here? Exactly, the, the white opposition. 
So if there was a reaction, let's say that they get into a physical altercation and a struggle, then the appearance here can be skewed and argued that the African-American protesters were the ones who were the aggressor in the action. So the non-reaction in a non-violent social protest is absolutely essential because it is getting that message across and clearly delineating who's in the right and who's in the wrong. And SNCC was very, very, very successful in teaching that and practicing that with the students before they carry out their protest. Okay, CORE is going to also get involved in these protest efforts with the Freedom Rides. They're going to test interstate commerce, right? So we've got the, the interstate um, a highway system that was constructed during Eisenhower's administration that crosses through state um, boundaries. And when there is transportation across state boundaries, that becomes a federal priority, right? Maintaining transportation unity. That goes all the way back to the situation with the railroads. Remember we talked about the railroads where um, the Hepburn Act and the Elkins Act were the railroads that were crossing across um, over state lines, couldn't charge different rates and things. So this is going to challenge that. Will the federal government step in and protect these protesters as they move through um, various states? So they have uh, chartered a couple of Greyhound buses and they're going to leave Washington, DC and they're going to travel all the way through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, uh, into Mississippi and Louisiana. And they're going to stop at bus stations along the way that are segregated, but they are not going to practice segregation on the bus or in the bus stations. And they're challenging, what's the federal government gonna do? And so this was organized by CORE and these two buses leave and they start to get a little bit more attention as they make their way through uh, Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina. They get to the Atlanta bus station and there are protesters there um, against the, uh, the, the Freedom Ride. They throw things at the bus. Um, the bus continues on. When they cross over the state line from Georgia into Alabama, they go into the city of Anniston, Alabama. And that's where one of the buses is firebombed. You can see what is left over of that bus. And when the um, participants had to scramble to get out of the bus, what they were met with is a crowd of white supremacists who are going to violently beat them as they get off of the bus. So things are getting worse as they're moving through Alabama and they know that they're headed to Mississippi, which is probably going to be even worse in terms of um, how they're going to be received there. 1961, this is John Kennedy is president at this time. And in 1961, Kennedy is going to want to avoid these violent scenes on television. Um, so they end up, uh, the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who is JFK's brother, who is the, the head of the uh, legal representation for the federal government, um, he negotiates with the Mississippi governor and leadership and basically says that, um, that the federal government has to maintain the safety of the participants on the bus but when it comes to violating local ordinances of segregation, that's up to the state. So it, it's kind of a, um, a mixed reaction of what happens with the Freedom Riders when they get into Mississippi. So as expected, the Mississippi Guard protects their safety, but does not protect their political rights um, or legal rights within the state of Mississippi. And so they are arrested for disturbing the peace. Okay, so Birmingham, Alabama uh, was thought to be one of the most racist cities in America by Martin Luther King Jr. And he is going to organize nonviolent social protest in the city of Alabama, uh, I mean of Birmingham, Alabama. And the police commissioner is Bull Connor. And he is definitely a white supremacist who is opposed to any of these nonviolent protests. So again, look at how this image plays out here. You have these protesters who are peacefully sitting. Here is the, the fire hoses that are brought out. The police dogs are brought out. There's an iconic image of the police dog biting one of the protesters. 
but you don't see the reaction back because again, who is clearly in the wrong from this image? Ultimately, Martin Luther King is arrested for his roles in the Birmingham protest and it erupts into riots because these white supremacists are going to try um, to disperse the crowds and they take very, very violent action. While Martin Luther King Jr. is in, in jail, he writes the letter from a Birmingham jail. And we're also going to be looking at this in class as well. And it's really authored to other ministers. And it's talking about that the time is now. Now you have to take action. You know, this is an important um, part of the, the protest to achieve civil rights. So we will be reading that. And I want you to pay very close attention to its format. All right, by 1963, we're going to see the March on Washington actually happen. So A. Philip Randolph, the one who first proposed this during World War II, is going to come back and uh, with Bayard Rustin, the two of them will plan and actually carry out this time the March on Washington. They will work together with SCLC chapters in communities across America, with SNCC chapters from colleges across America, to coordinate the transportation of people to attend this, uh, this rally in Washington, DC. Estimates are that there were upwards of 250,000 people who showed up at the March on Washington. And um, even though it was really um, the, the idea of A. Philip Randolph, I think we most often associate Martin Luther King with the March on Washington because of his powerful speech um, about his vision, his dream for a United States that is integrated and that people are treated equally. So uh, we will also be looking at that in class a little bit more closely as well. By 1964, the Civil Rights Act is passed. All right, now if we back up the timing here, August of 1963, JFK is president in August of 1963, and he has had enough. After these riots in Birmingham, um, there was also bombing of a, a church in, in Birmingham on a Sunday, and these young girls were killed on their way to Sunday school. And Kennedy's had enough. So even though Kennedy is a Democrat, he is going to put forward a civil rights bill um, to be passed by the Congress that will, again, further enforce the court ruling from 1957. Because again, integration hasn't been achieved in most schools across America. So when Kennedy puts this forward, there is um, significant backlash. By November of 63, Kennedy is assassinated, okay? 1964 was going to be an election year. Kennedy was going to be up for re-election. That's why he was in Dallas, was to launch um, his campaign. He was there in early 1963, exactly a year prior to the election in November of 64. And so he was there to kind of just launch his campaign for re-election. He was assassinated and Lyndon Johnson becomes the new president. Now, Lyndon Johnson was from Texas. So there were people who thought that he might be a larger supporter of maintaining state power over this issue. But instead, Lyndon Johnson comes out squarely on the side of passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and he is able to push that through. Now, one of the things that you need to remember is that Kennedy had this bill. Kennedy had this vision for civil rights legislation, but Kennedy didn't have the savvy skill and experience, decades of experience that Lyndon Johnson has. Kennedy didn't have the experience to kind of maneuver and make deals within the Congress to get the bill passed. Remember the trouble that they had in 1850, getting the, uh, the Compromise of 1850 passed? And so that had to be maneuvered through the legislature. Civil Rights Act of 64 has to be maneuvered as well. And so there are some very, very tense conversations between Lyndon Johnson and Richard Russell of Georgia, who's kind of the Democratic leader of this group you know, that had led the Southern Manifesto. Um, he's got to work through them to get this legislation passed. So there were a lot of behind the scenes deals that were made, but ultimately the law is passed and look what is included here. So it's Kennedy's ideas, but it's gonna be passed during the um, um, presidency of Lyndon Johnson. But look what it says. 
It bans segregation in all public facilities. The federal government must compel the states to integrate. And so what they're gonna do by compelling, it means that you are um, giving them really no other choice but to integrate now. When was the Brown case decided? That was in 1954. So we're a decade later and integration still has not happened. The only timing that was provided was in Brown two in 1955 that said with all deliberate speed. So what the federal government does here in 1964 is they begin to tie federal funding for all kinds of programs, including um, um, transportation, you know, money for building roads and highways and that kind of thing. Your money that you get from the federal government as a state depends on whether or not your schools are integrated. So they're tying it to money where the states really aren't gonna have much of a choice but to go ahead and integrate. They also make people who violate civil rights laws be prosecuted in a federal court rather than a state court. That goes back to the issues with Emmett Till and Emmett Till's murderers being found not guilty by a court uh, in, in their hometown. And then it's also going to outlaw employment discrimination. So it takes that executive order um, and makes it into a permanent law. What's missing from this list? Because this is a great list. This is a lot of progress here in civil rights legislation, but there's something really, really big that's not part of the criteria. And I would be very clear on this. And what's missing is voting. There's no protection here for African-American voting. The following year in 1965, um, we will see the Voting Rights Act passed, right? So people trying to, to get voting rights um, added in, you're gonna have SNCC heavily involved in that. June, 1964, we know it was the election year. So that summer, you're going to see students trying to go down into the deep South and register African-Americans to vote because they largely have not been exercising that right ever since reconstruction ended in 1877. So these SNCC workers go down, Freedom Summer, they go to Mississippi, and almost immediately these three college students turn up missing. And the authorities in Mississippi are like, well, of course they're missing. They got scared, they went home. You know, nothing's happened here in Mississippi. Well, they finally launch an investigation. The FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation comes in, not just state authorities that don't really want anything to be uncovered. And the FBI comes in and they find that these three college students were brutally, brutally murdered um, at the hands of white supremacists here in Mississippi. Um, so you would think that some of the, the kids at that point might've been scared and gone home. Vast majority will stay and carry on with Freedom Summer in registering African-Americans to vote. This woman, Fannie Lou Hamer, is also going to take that effort a step further. And she wants African-American voters represented in the Mississippi Democratic Party delegation that will go to the convention and cast their votes for the candidate in um, the presidential race. So this would be like the primary votes when uh, they go and are, are choosing who the nominee will be in the, the Democratic Party. Um, the Democratic Party of Mississippi refused to allow African-American delegates to be part of the, the Mississippi con, um, delegation that goes to the convention. So they formed their own party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and Fannie Lou Hamer is the head of that. So you've got Ella Baker, who's leading SNCC, and you have Fannie Lou Hamer, who is heading this voting rights um, effort in Mississippi. When they get to the Democratic convention, they are refused access. So the Mississippi delegation is, is turned away. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer is turned away. The white Mississippi delegation is allowed to be seated. So there's a lot of turmoil that's going on here politically. By 1965, um, we're going to see more protest again about voting rights. And there is a march from Selma, Alabama to the Capitol at Montgomery and it's gonna be called, it ends up being called Bloody Sunday. So these marchers, they leave Selma on a Sunday morning. They're crossing over the Edmund Pettus Bridge on their way to Montgomery to, um, you know, in this march to, to draw attention to the lack of voting rights. And they know 
that there's going to be opposition. And again, it's just drawing attention to this very, very critical element that had been left out of the Civil Rights Act of 64. And it's caught on television. When they get to the other side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you can definitely see here the heavy police presence and the police go after the protesters. Um, one person who you may be familiar with is John Lewis here from Atlanta. And John Lewis was, uh, he was a close associate of Martin Luther King Jr. Again, they were both from Atlanta. And John Lewis was beaten severely here at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. And in recent years, before he passed away, he just passed away in the, in the past year or so, um, John Lewis used to go every year, go back to Selma uh, and commemorate that walk. And, um, you know, very, very powerful scene. And he had been a representative representing the state of Georgia in the House of Representatives for many, many years. But this was where he was severely, severely beaten during the civil rights protest of the 60s. By 1965, as a result of all of this, a new law is passed, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and it will ban literacy tests or discrimination in voting based on race. And there you can see Martin Luther King um, celebrating the signing of this document with Lyndon Johnson. Also, the 24th Amendment is passed, which will ban a poll tax. So this is going to prevent a state from charging money to register people to vote. <coughs> you cannot charge money. So that poll tax is going to be a critical component as well. All right, so what's happening to the New Deal Coalition? Um, we'd already seen, begin to see it fracture a little bit in 1948. By 1965, it is over. So we see these white Southern Democrats who are very, very opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 being passed and they will back out of the Democratic Party and they become Republican voters. So we're, you know, we've been looking at these election maps ever since Reconstruction and we've seen the solid South always, always, always voting Democratic. We're gonna see that change because these white Southern voters are going to no longer vote with the Democratic Party because of their dissatisfaction with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act being passed. So the solid South is gone by 1965. All right, the last section that we're going to be looking at is how all of this is just changing so very slowly. Even though you've got the Civil Rights Act that's passed in 64, there is still reluctance to integrate schools uh, across the Deep South. So you're gonna see most of them will be integrated because of that money that's tied to all of this um, happening. You're going to see most of them integrate by the late 1960s into the early 1970s. Um, when I was in elementary school, it was, it, was, um, it was relatively new uh, in Fulton County to have integrated schools at that time when I was in elementary school. And I don't know that the teachers handled it very well, to be honest with you. Um, so it was, it was um, definitely an unusual time in the late 60s and early 70s when it came to integration. So this slow pace of reform is going to cause a change in the movement. Now, everything that we've talked about from Brown versus Board of Education with the, the legal um, challenges that the NAACP is going to launch through all of the nonviolent organizations like CORE and SNCC and SCLC, all of that is going to kind of lead to some other changes by the time we get to the late 60s into the early 70s because you've still got um, um, protection of rights, but there's still discrimination. And a lot of that has to do with poverty uh, and problems within certain areas and lack of police protection and brutality that's continuing to be lodged against African-Americans. And there will be other oppressed populations in the United States, in particular, Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Native Americans or American Indians who will adopt these types of, of tactics, nonviolent protests, um, to draw attention to their causes. So this is moving kind of into the late part. This is after civil rights legislation has been passed, but there's still not true equality that's been established. So um, there is and has for years been um, an effort for black nationalism to be promoted. 
We started talking about that with Frederick Douglass in the 1800s, um, his very famous speech to what, um, to what is the 4th of, July, 4th of July to a black man and very, very powerful speech that we looked at. Then Marcus Garvey and his back to Africa movement in the 1920s and the Harlem Renaissance. And then here in the 1960s, we're going to see kind of this change um, and black nationalism can turn into black separatism. And that's gonna be uh, largely supported by the Nation of Islam, which is another organization that comes about. So look at what we've got here. So black nationalism, and then we began to see cultural, religious, political, economic, and territorial um, nationalism but then that becomes separatism where black businesses are forming, black culture is being preserved. And so it's looking at this idea of separating the races and that's what the nation of Islam is promoting. So it's similar to the ideas of Marcus Garvey. So this nation of Islam is a radical, radical branch of, um, of, of the civil rights movement and it rejects Christianity, but it is not um, truly aligned with the Islamic faith that is about peace. Um, that's one of the basic tenets of, of Islam. So it's, it's kind of something in between, and it is about this idea of separatism. So one of the, the foundations here, they say that Allah will banish the white devils and give the black nation justice. And this organization is founded by Elijah Muhammad. And he is going to have a large number of followers that will set up organizations connected to the nation of Islam across the United States. One of the, the um, more famous of the nation of Islam members is Malcolm X. His actual name is Malcolm Little, but he adopted X as his last name to represent the fact that he doesn't know what his true last name is, that as um, a descendant of, of former enslaved persons, when the Civil War ended, they just made up last names. And so this was, he didn't know, he's saying that his true identity has been lost due to racism and slavery in the United States. So he is a, a big supporter of the Nation of Islam, but after he goes on the pilgrimage to Mecca, in 1964, and he sees all of these people from all of these races coming together to worship, and it's very peaceful. He's kind of overcome, and he changes his approach, and he breaks from the Nation of Islam, and that's going to cause a rift within the organization because he's the one who carries the popularity, and he is beginning to address his views um, a little bit you know, less forceful related to separatism. And he start, starts this organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. All right, he gets assassinated by members of the Nation of Islam while he's given a speech in Harlem. And uh, again, it's just causing a lot of uproar. So I wanna show you this clip and it is um, looking at the Malcolm X legacy because it is very, very complicated with his ties to the Nation of Islam, with his break from the Nation of Islam and his ultimate assassination. But he never lost sight of the fact that the job was not finished in terms of civil rights, just because the law has been passed, civil rights have not been fully achieved, but there is this transition of how it should be approached. So I wanna show you this. Um, I wanna make sure that the sound is, is working here. So let me try to share my screen again and double check that I've got um, the sound as part of this. Okay, so here we go. Tomorrow marks 50 years since the assassination of Malcolm X. The charismatic and controversial leader was gunned down while giving a speech here in New York City. CBS ends Vladimir Dudier spoke with his family about a complicated legacy. Vlad, good morning. Good morning. Malcolm X was a minister, an orator, a revolutionary, but for Atala Shabazz, he was simply her father. Shabazz is the eldest of his six daughters, a child when he was killed. And she says that while America continues to search for guidance in Malcolm's words, she sees his vision playing out all around us. Harlem has always been a really classic um, town. Not Today, Atala Shabazz is a writer, and teacher, mentor, and her daughter still trying to clarify her father's place in history. 
we took a walk with her in his old neighborhood on the street now named in his honor. So it's nice that Lennox is named after my dad. Although I'm sure he probably would be embarrassed. He would be very shy. Right? It, yeah. That's a side of Malcolm X that only those closest to him knew. This is the Malcolm X Americans remember. And it is time for you and me to fight for ourselves. The controversial leader preaching equality by any means necessary. Your father's message, do you feel it's been misinterpreted over the years? Oh, sure. I understand people needing to hold on to the strength they associate to him. Mm. However, they do him a disservice, an injustice, when they excerpt him and redefine them in their way and not as he is. Here in Harlem, Malcolm was the voice of black frustration. Has integration solved the problem or made it worse? Angry over poverty, police brutality, and segregation. Critics labeled him a radical militant. Supporters said he was uncompromising in his mission. To lift the struggle for freedom of the Negro in this country from the level of civil rights to the level of human rights. That's what he told a young CBS reporter named Mike Wallace, who was in search of the true Malcolm X, of the message and the man. Wallace filed his first report in 1959. White people don't realize how frustrated Negroes have become. But they are also of a, the opinion that no good can possibly come from violence. If they are of that opinion, Mike, if you think that uh, the powder keg that's in your house is going to explode under certain conditions, either you have to remove the powder keg or remove the condition. His message was deeply tied to the circumstances of his own life. As a youth, his father's murder left him hardened and angry. At age 20, Malcolm went to prison for larceny. It was there he converted to a growing movement of black separatism, the Nation of Islam. If the government can't defend us, what should we do? If the government doesn't want us to pick up a rifle, then defend us. Go find out who bombed the church in, in Birmingham, Alabama. In his 30s, he went through yet another transformation. After a trip to Mecca in 1964, he publicly embraced working with anyone who was willing to work with him. You have changed your attitude about the white man in the United States to some extent. Well, I've broadened my scope. Travel broadens your scope. Uh, it gives you a wider understanding. He revealed all of this to Wallace, who throughout his life remained close to Malcolm's family. They were brethren, cared for each other off record, despite profession. Um, when they met, they realized that they had much more in common, and people publicly would never have imagined or presume so. When Malcolm broke away from the Nation of Islam, I wanted you to know that my house was bombed. It was bombed by the black Muslim movement. It earned him many enemies within the group. Are you not perhaps afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. Then suddenly it happened. On February 21st, 1965, three members from the Nation of Islam shot Malcolm while he was giving a speech in Upper Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom. From the second floor ballroom, the grim staccato of a dozen shots. He was just 39 years old. And there are few of us that get to call upon each other on these various dates and experience what we've inherited in terms of the radiance of our relatives' legacies and also the ache in, in their absence. While he predicted his own death, he could not have foreseen how his vision would play out or when America might see its first black president. Men and women who fought for our freedoms most certainly expected to see a black president. I think that it took 40 years is the crime. And so the question becomes not for those who have been marginalized, but for those who are in a position to do better, do more. What are we waiting on? These are the questions Shabazz never stopped asking. Do you still have conversations with your father? Oh, God, all the time. Look, you can't be that potent and then be gone. Mm. Wow. This relationship between Mike and, and Malcolm X was really amazing because Malcolm X, um, Mike took him to a dinner with yeah. Edgar Bronkman, who was CEO of Sagram, then a leading uh, Jewish activist here in New York City, uh, showing Mike trying to bridge some of the misunderstandings. Awesome. Yeah, it was a good, and you know, one of the things she spoke about is the fact that you can either be a Malcolm, X, a Malcolm X fan or a Martin Luther King fan, but there's room for both. For both. I think it's good she's speaking out about her dad. Glad, thank you so much. All right, so again, I just think that does a, a great job of, of kind of telling the story of Malcolm X. So there are two documents that I think you really need to compare. Um, one of the more famous Malcolm X speeches, The Ballad or the Bullet, which we'll be looking at in class. 
and the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. So we will be comparing those. And largely what you're gonna end up coming up with is how they're similar, which is obviously their, their ultimate goal, but yet how they're different. This is very similar to what we did with Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Same goal, different methods, okay? So we would be looking at um, all of these different comparisons. So you might wanna consider these as you are looking at these two individuals. All right, so um, I don't know what happened there. That doesn't work. Okay, uh, so we will finish up looking at this, this more militant part of the civil rights movement that begins to emerge. Stokely Carmichael, he's a student in SNCC. And if we look at by now, 1967, we've got almost a decade that they are, are working towards equality and the students are frustrated. They're very angry. And so Stokely Carmichael kind of breaks from SNCC and begins to start this more um, um, aggressive approach that's known as black power. So again, they're looking at is integration truly going to be achieved? What does this mean? And that it would be better for African-Americans to have their own businesses promote their own community through what's known as black power. Out of Black Power, there's going to be an organization known as the Black Panthers that will form. They are armed um, members who will go into urban areas and protect African-Americans from police brutality. So when you've got armed resistance with police who are armed, it does turn violent in a number of, of situations. So the Black Power Panthers begin in San Francisco with Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. And then there are Black Panther Party um, organizations that crop up in other communities across the United States. All right, other groups that begin to protest and demand equality and rights, uh, Puerto Ricans in New York City form the Young Lords. And it is very similar where there is an effort to draw attention to discrimination against African American, I mean, um, uh, Puerto Ricans in the same vein that African-Americans had, had drawn that attention to their situation as well. Poverty is still an issue that's not been addressed. And we're gonna look at this more closely when we get to um, um, Lyndon Johnson's domestic policy and the Kerner Commission. We've already mentioned that where they go in and they look at what is the source of all of these riots where there are urban areas that are being burnt down by its own citizens. And it's largely due to discrimination. Um, so the Chicano movement, this is going to be Mexican Americans who are demanding equality and they are going to be led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And they work together in the, um, uh, the migrant workers out in California form a union, the United Farm Workers, and they are going to boycott their lack of payment and fair treatment. And uh, Cesar Chavez starts this and he creates this this large nationwide effort to boycott California grapes. And if you don't buy grapes anywhere in the United States, you're putting pressure on those owners of those farms to pay the migrant workers fair wages. And Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta are key and instrumental in the Chicano movement. Um, when we look at the Chicano movement, there is like the, the Black Panthers wore Black Berets the Brown Berets was a group of Mexican Americans who were organizing and trying to draw attention to their situation. And that's where the Chicano and the Chicana uh, term comes from. It's talking about power within the Mexican American community. All right, American Indians are also going to try to protest against their hundreds of years of discrimination at the hands of the American government. Group of American Indians will take control of the old abandoned prison at Alcatraz, the island. It's out here in San Francisco. And they say that they're going to pay the government $24 in glass beads to, um, to buy the island, similar to what had been done during the colonial period when the colonists bought um, Manhattan Island from the natives. And they occupy Alcatraz for close to a year. 
and they're drawing attention to the cause. And so you can see Indians welcome United Indian property. Um, and so this was a standoff between the American Indian groups and the, um, uh, the government. Here are some more pictures from inside. If you go to Alcatraz today, they have a whole exhibit related to this. All right, and then the final part of this, it turns violent at Wounded Knee. There is a, an effort to reclaim the, the territory there and um, it turns violent. You've got a standoff with the military. People are killed, people are wounded at the standoff at Wounded Knee, kind of hearkening back to that violence um, with the Sioux back in the late 1870s and 1880s. All right, so that is our discussion of the civil rights movement. We've seen a lot of different organizations, a lot of different people involved. That's important for you to keep straight and the approaches that they will each take. So until next time, keep reading and go make history.